Who's dead? No way. How? Wow. You never think generals are going to die in the battles, you know? But, but he was pretty young, right? Huh? Youngest general they had. Wow. Not even 40. Wow again. Well, it, it, it's a war. Yeah. Okay. February 24th, 1945. They've sent a massive armada to take a tiny but very well defended island. And this week, the Americans make their landings on Iwo Jima. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the siege of Budapest ended in the Soviets' favor. They continued advancing in other parts of the Eastern Front. The Canadian Army advanced in the West. The Americans advanced on Luzon. The British Army began crossing the Irrawaddy in Burma. And the Japanese defenses on Iwo Jima were bombarded in preparation for an American invasion, which happens this week. Iwo Jima is actually part of the official Tokyo metropolitan area, though 1,200 kilometers south of it. I talked last week about the island, the defenses, and who's attacking it, so I'm not going to go over all that again. But it's two marine divisions from 5th Amphibious Corps landing, 4th and 5th, and with 3rd Division in reserve. This is Operation Detachment. The Japanese have like 21,000 men here under Tadamichi Kuribayashi, and they have exceptionally good and well-prepared defenses around the entire island and miles and miles of tunnels. John Marquand, writing for Harper's Weekly, writes, At dawn on D-Day, the waters of Iwo Jima looked like New York Harbor on a busy day. He also writes, At 9 o'clock exactly, the first assault wave was due to hit the beach, but before that, Iwo Jima was due to receive its final polishing. It's eight square miles. We're waiting to take everything we could pour into them. And they must have already received a heavier weight of fire than any Navy in the world had previously concentrated upon so small an area. That may well be true. U.S. Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal is even on hand to watch this. Richmond Turner barks out the order, land the landing force, and they head for the shores. They get a nasty surprise when they reach them because the volcanic sand is so fine that the amph tracks can't get a grip on it. Discipline in some places begins breaking down. As they can't advance, can't dig holes for safety, and mortars start raining shells down on them from Mount Suribachi. The Japanese might not be contesting the landings in person, but they sure are doing so from afar. That was their plan. Strike when the beaches are crowded. Okay, some units make better progress than others. 1st Battalion from 28th Marine Regiment crosses the thin neck of the island, cutting off Mount Suribachi at its base. The 27th Regiment, on their right, makes for the outer defenses of the number 1 airfield. Those units are from 5th Marine Division. How was it for the 4th? Well, Sergeant Grady Gallant from the 25th Marine Regiment writes, it was quite impossible to dig a hole. The gravel was too slippery, too shifting and powder light, too formless. It was as dry as quicksand that sucked at anything touching it, filling every hole as soon as it was formed. Turner wires Pacific Ocean Area Commander Chester Nimitz at 11 a.m. that the landings went off well and that there were light casualties, but this is not the case. I doubt he can see the beaches clearly through the dust and the smoke, but still. The Marines land 30,000 men this day, but take nearly 2,000 casualties. And the beachhead is still under heavy fire, and not as deep as they'd planned. On the 20th, it becomes obvious to Holland Smith they can only take Iwo Jima yard by yard. Over the next three days, Task Force 58 continues to give heavy support, but are themselves hit hard. On the 21st, escort carrier Bismarck C is sunk by a couple of kamikaze planes, and fleet carrier Saratoga, another escort carrier, and several smaller ships are damaged. The general plan for Iwo Jima is for the 5th Division to head for the western shore and then turn north, except for the 28th Regiment, who turns south for Suribachi. The rest are driving in line with the 4th Division, who land on the eastern beaches and head north. When 3rd Division lands, it will head north between them. By the 22nd, the Marines have taken most 
of the first airfield north of the beachhead, and they are inching their way up Mount Suribachi. Every advance needs enormous firepower, since the Japanese defense is tough as nails. It takes three days for 28th Regiment to make its way up Mount Suribachi, fighting the entire way. On the morning of the 23rd, a combat patrol of 45 men manages to fight their way to the top of Suribachi and run the American flag up on a length of pipe. There's an already famous photo of that making the rounds today and tomorrow, but it's actually not that. Not that flag, I mean. See, that flag is considered too small to be seen the other side of the mountain where the fight for the airfields inches along. And no photo was taken of its raising either. So a second, larger flag is found in one of the LSTs and sent up the mountain, and raising this one is photographed by combat photographer Joe Rosenthal. Capturing Suribachi gives the Marines control of basically the southern third of the island, but Graves Erskine's third division, the reserves, are already being landed because after five days of fighting, casualties are over 6,000, and this fight looks to be a long battle of attrition. Today, the 24th, the advance takes part of the second airfield. Airfields here are within fighter range of Tokyo, so B-29s from the Marianas can be escorted. This would also be a good landing spot for damaged bombers. These are not the only American landings in the Pacific region this week. In the Philippines on the 19th and 20th come American landings on the northwest of Samar Island and the nearby smaller islands off its coast of Dalupiri, Kapul, and Biri. They face some resistance on Biri. This ran counter to both MacArthur's original plan and to directives from the Joint Chiefs, who intended to leave operations in the bypassed islands to the Filipino guerrilla forces. The bloody destruction the Japanese had forced on Manila, however, had so hardened MacArthur's determination that he decided to use the full weight of the forces at his disposal to liberate the Philippines as fast as possible, island by island. As for the fight on Luzon, by the 21st, U.S. 11th Corps has eliminated all organized resistance on Bataan, so the bay is no longer under threat. That same day on Corregidor Island, a Japanese attempt to blast their way out of the Malinta Tunnel to freedom instead goes badly wrong when tons of TNT explodes prematurely. Well, some sources say it's an attempt to blast out. Others say it's a suicidal attempt to take some of the enemy with them. In this case, six Americans in a landslide caused by the explosion. On the 23rd, a raid on Los Baños frees 2,147 military and civilian prisoners. As for the ongoing Battle of Manila, the U.S. 1st Cavalry Division finishes taking the Japanese strong points at the High Commissioner's Residence and the Army Navy Club. And then, on the 21st, they attack the Manila Hotel, backed by a platoon of tanks. The penthouse here was MacArthur's pre-war home. There's not a whole lot left of it. And 37th Division, after three failed tries, manages to finally take the new police station by entering a second floor window and then firing down with flamethrowers through holes in the floor. They then take City Hall and the post office with more, more bloody urban combat. The last strong point before Intramuros is a bunch of buildings to its south, including the University of the Philippines and the Philippine General Hospital. The reinforced concrete cluster was heavily manned by the Manila Naval Defense Force, in one building, for example, by 250 Japanese sailor infantry. Elaborate compartmental sandbagging with automatic weapons fire from the top floors and emplacements along the foundation were typical. But campus buildings with space between allowed a devastating pattern of crossfires. That's the university. The hospital has big red crosses on the roof to identify it, and there are no Japanese troops inside it, though they have machine guns outside. There are 7,000 patients and refugees within it, however, and they need to be brought to safety. But the fight for Intramuros itself does begin late in the week. This was originally a fortress for the Spanish inhabitants, and it's pretty tough. The walls are seven or eight meters high, 13 meters thick at the bottom, and six or seven at the top. It's also surrounded by a moat and a park, and that's open fields of fire for attackers to cross. MacArthur, 
has ruled out aerial bombardment, but they've brought up and arranged 132 artillery pieces for an area one kilometer by 700 meters, and they've already taken out the enemy artillery within. The preliminary bombardment began already the 17th, battering the walls and hoping to open breaches in the eastern wall for the infantry to come through on the big attack day. That day is yesterday, the 23rd, and when the guns go silent, the 129th and 145th regiments storm the breaches, unopposed as it turns out. The Japanese soon are up and fighting, but allowing the enemy to break in without having to face those deadly fields of fire sort of determines the outcome. All that day, the fight continues within the walls, but by today, it is just mainly mopping up. Other than the hospital and the university, there are still three buildings of the national government that hold out. They are not to be attacked until after Intramuros falls, though, because it gives better firing positions on them. We'll see the fight for them next week, but as this week ends, the forces so far heavily engaged on Luzon, the 43rd, 40th, 37th and 1st Cavalry Divisions were winning and without replacements were also weakening. As for the fighting on the Irrawaddy River in Burma, 20th Division from 33rd Corps is still fighting all week to secure its bridgehead, although by this week the Japanese attacks are mostly suicidal bonsai charges. So you get numbers like, like two Japanese battalions who have over 1,200 men together take 953 killed this week. As the week ends though, 20th Division still has not established a secure bridgehead. 2nd Division from 33rd Corps tries crossing east of them the 20th at Nagazun and they get hit hard with Bill Slim, 14th Army Commander, saying the crossing, if not a failure, was near to becoming one. As for 4th Corps crossings down south, which began last week, 17th Division and its armor are all across by the 21st, and the advance on Mike Tila, 120 kilometers away, can begin, which it does, taking Tongtha today as the week ends. Another river crossing gets going this week over in Western Europe. The floodwaters of the Ruhr River have now subsided enough for the postponed American Operation Grenade to finally go off, and the artillery barrage begins at 2.45 a.m., the morning of the 23rd, with three corps of Bill Simpson's 9th Army surging forward from 3.30 a.m. The current is still over 10 kilometers per hour, and the Americans lose a total of 600 storming boats. German machine gun fire contributes a lot to that total, of course. But after a few hours, the numbers tell in the American favor. Three footbridges have been set up across the river by 7 a.m., and a heavier bridge that can handle vehicles by four that afternoon. Most of the American casualties this day are engineers. Today, 19th Corps takes Yulish. Well, this morning, 16 local villages have also been captured and nearly 30 battalions have crossed the river. By this evening, there are 19 bridges in place, seven of which can handle tanks. The Canadians and British are still advancing further north in Operation Veritable towards Uydem and Visa and to the south, 3rd Army is attacking as well. On the 18th, 8th Corps breaks through the Siegfried Line north of Echternach, and 12th and 20th Corps gain ground to the south, just about totally clearing the Saar-Moselle Triangle by the 21st. The Allies are advancing in Italy this week as well. Operation Encore begins this week. This is attacks by the U.S. 10th Mountain Division and the Brazilian Expeditionary Force, the only South American nation that sent over combat troops, actually. The general idea is to clear the area west of the Reno and Route 64 from Pistoia to Bologna. This would give better starting points for a big spring offensive to come later. Encore begins the 18th in the freezing cold, but by the 23rd, the Mountain Division has taken Monte della Torraccia. On the American right, the Brazilians attack Monte Castello on the 21st. Fourth Corps Command does not think they will take it before Toracha falls, but this they do. When Toracha does fall, phase one ends. Phase two will wait for better weather before it begins. I have not mentioned the Eastern Front yet this week, but there is stuff over there going on in Soviet Command. Okay, on the 18th, 
Soviet leader Joseph Stalin talks to Chief of Staff Alexander Vasilevsky about how things are going in East Prussia. Stalin says Vasilevsky should go there in person to assist Third Belarusian and First Baltic fronts. Stalin explained that these forces would be needed to reinforce the main strike force for the attack on Berlin, but, equally important, he wanted to know what forces could be released for transfer to the Far East. Vasilevsky learned that Stalin wanted two or three of the best armies pinpointed for the move to the Far East, where, Stalin continued, Vasilevsky himself would most likely be going to direct operations, roughly two or three months after the German surrender. Vasilevsky then asks if he can be relieved as chief of staff, which is kind of reasonable since lately his deputy Alexei Antonov has been doing pretty much all of the chief of staff work since Vasilevsky has so much else on his plate. Stalin says yes, so meeting over. But a few hours later, Stalin summons Vasilevsky to a meeting again. Third Belarusian front commander Ivan Chernyakovsky, the youngest front commander in the Red Army, has just died in East Prussia. The New York Times writes, the conqueror of Minsk, Vilna, Kaunas, and most of East Prussia, he died from a heavy wound received on the battlefield of East Prussia, said the official announcement. On the 19th, Stalin signs the Stavka order naming Vasilevsky as Chernyakovsky's replacement as front commander. Ivan Bagramian's first Baltic front has been told by Stavka to ignore Königsberg for the time being and focus on the enemy in Samland, while Vasilevsky does the same to focus on the Heiligenbeil pocket. However, Bagramian's attack is to begin the 22nd, and already the 20th, German Armee Abteilung Samland notches a spoiler attack and reaches Königsberg, so the fight here is far from over. Stavka then gets rid of First Baltic Front, giving its armies to Third Belarusian Front as the Samland Group, and gives Vasilevsky a month to reorganize and then get rid of the Germans there. Meanwhile, Georgi Zhukov's First Belarusian Front's right flank launches the attacks it planned last week. Well, they try to at least. But though there is fighting to maybe retake Answald, Second Guard's tank army, who are to lead the assault, are still facing German attacks and they can't really go over to offense. Zhukov then goes back over to defense, but Stavka has plans for his front and Konstantin Rokossovsky's second Belarusian front. They have new orders to lock flanks and hit East Pomerania, driving generally towards Kohlberg on the coast, cutting the Germans in two. If you missed last week's episode, then go back and see why this change in plans. Then Rokossovsky would turn east towards Gdynia and Danzig, and Zhukov would clear the western area. The attacks are not to go off together. Rokossovsky's is set for today the 24th, and Zhukov's March 1st at the latest, kicking off when Rokossovsky reaches the baldenberg neustettin line. Vasilevsky is to move 3rd Belarusian over to the Gulf of Danzig east of the Vistula to cut off any escape route. Rokossovsky's attack starts today as scheduled, and as the week ends, it looks promising. In the rear, the Soviets are still trying to eliminate strong points they bypassed in their drive. Poznan is one such place, and Vasily Chuikov's 8th Guards Army begins storming its citadel the 20th. Two days of hand-to-hand -hand combat follow. The storm operation recalled the breaking of a medieval siege, filling the moat and mining the outer wall, though a modern touch was supplied by tanks and self-propelled guns making their way through the breach in the walls. The 22nd, it is over. The garrison commander has killed himself, and the Germans march out in good order. Chuikov was at Stalingrad when it fell, you may remember. And the end here is a real contrast. This is a big deal too, though. Poznan was a main goal of the whole offensive when it began last month for a good reason. It's a supply and transport hub. And now, troops and ammunition can race to the Oder bridgeheads, easing what has been real shortages. Chuikov's army turns its attention to the Oder, heading over to between Frankfurt and Kustrin, east of Berlin. 
by the 21st, Ivan Konyev's first Ukrainian front advance has five armies who've reached the Nysis stretched out from its confluence with the Oder to north of Gorlitz. From there, the front goes across to the Oder at Opel. German command tells army groups Vistula and Center that the coming Soviet main effort is going to be on the Oder and Nysa between Schwedt and Görlitz. Makes logical sense. They also expect subsidiary drives into Pomerania and Moravia. In the army group center zone, Third Guard's tank armies, fast about faced west of Breslau, showed it was obviously in a hurry to get to Nysa. Air reconnaissance disclosed that the Polish railroads had been relayed to east of Poznan and east of Breslau. In Lower Silesia, the Soviet engineers were rushing to build bridges on the recently crossed rivers, an indication that the first Ukrainian front planned to keep the offensive rolling. From one of the Soviet tank corps, the Germans captured maps covering the area between the Elbe and the Nysa. And then, Konyav calls it all to a halt. Yep, on the 21st. Even though crossing the Nysa against the mere six divisions the Germans have on the river doesn't seem like it would be too much of a hurdle. Why? Good question. Zimke postulates that maybe the whole thing hasn't gone as well as Konyev expected, or perhaps it's because Zhukov's offensive was turned to go north instead of to Berlin, but it's Zhukov who has been designated the conqueror of Berlin. Well, the Soviets have conquered most of Poland, at least, by now. On the 23rd, the Moscow Commission meets for the first time. They are to implement what was agreed to do with Poland in future, two weeks ago at the Yalta conference. Sparks fly straight off the bat. American and British ambassadors Harriman and Kerr want three Poles to be invited from outside of Poland, meaning from the government in exile in London. Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov says no, no, no. The Yalta agreement is only to consult the Warsaw Poles with no outsiders. He does, next week, agree to allow British and American observers in Poland, and the British government says sure, as long as that does not imply that they recognize the Warsaw Poles as the official government of Poland. There will be more on this in a few weeks, for this week of the war has reached its end. With ever more Soviet attacks in the east, plenty of allied attacks in the west and Italy, the fight on Luzon advancing even as other Philippine islands are landed on, tough fighting on the Irrawaddy and the big American invasion of Iwo Jima. Oh, and on the 23rd, Turkey declares war on Germany and Japan. The next day, Egypt does so as well. Just after making the declaration before parliament, Egyptian Prime Minister Ahmad Maher Pasha is assassinated. I know that I did not cover the Axis offensive in Hungary this week. That I will get to next week. The Allies seem to be advancing everywhere. The Western Front, the Eastern Front, Italy, various Philippine islands, Burma, and now Iwo Jima. It really seems like the more it looks like the Axis will lose, the bigger the war actually grows. That may well continue, for things look like they might heat up again in China soon. It's all growing larger and larger as it nears its conclusion, but no one's giving in. No one's asking for terms or for an armistice. And so men by the tens of thousands are fed each and every week into the meat grinder, trying to fight its way to peace. And the more this war grows, the more artillery shells are fired. We've also tried something new, Sparty and I, right? Yep. Sparty and I recorded an informal discussion about our thoughts on the current state of this world war we're covering. That, too, is up exclusively for our Time Ghost Army members. Tobias Peel is our member of the week this week, and here are the most recent commissioned officers. The Army is what finances all of our productions, so for more stuff, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.